Hello, and welcome again to my show, Searching for Integrity. My name really is John Smith, and I'm searching for people with integrity. Why? Because our country suffers from IDD, Integrity Deficit Disorder. We have as our guest today, Mr. Ty Burr. He is an American film critic, columnist, and author who currently writes a film and popular culture newsletter. Are you there? I am. I am I, indeed. Good. Very good. Very good. I have uh, reviewed a lot of stuff, and uh, I'm going to let you just kind of uh, take off with the reins here in certain ways for you to decide what you want to uh, determine. I, uh, I had a, a, an in interesting uh, thought, and so I wrote it down. Um, you spent two decades with the Boston Globe. Is that's that correct. true? Yes, that's correct. That's an amazing feat. <laughs> I don't. I don't know it, but two two decades anywhere is is an amazing feat. Um, and my question is, do you miss it? Do I miss it? Um, no. Um, two decades is a long time to be anywhere. Um, I was very happy there. I, I, um, I still have many friends at the Boston Globe. It's a. It's the kind of institution that people can work at their entire lives. Um, one of my editors and close friends at the Boston Globe started working there in the 1980s. He is still there, um, getting on 40, 50 years later. And um, it's that kind of place. It's an institution in Boston. It's it's the paper, the New England's paper of record. Uh, and personally, I was, I was the film critic there. Uh, I was at a magazine in New York called Entertainment Weekly for about 11 years before that. So, you know, I tend to stay long at jobs, but also after 20 years, the business had changed so much. And by the business, I mean the newspaper business and the film industry and the way we watch movies right. had changed so much. Right. Right. I felt that we weren't writing about movies the way people watch them anymore. Um, and I decided to take a flyer on, on, a, on a newsletter, um, which I can talk about later, but basically started this thing called Tiber's Watch List to sort of address the way we watch movies and TV um, now, today. Right, right. I know that uh, lately, when I see the news and, and hear the news, um, what's your view of Twitter and Elon Musk, who now is, of course, the owner of Twitter? What do you think about all that? Uh, I've been on Twitter since 2009. I've I'm, uh, been that's sort of been my social media of choice. There's a good coterie of film people uh, sort of informally called film Twitter critics, filmmakers, film enthusiasts who all sort of know each other um, and um, share information and and gossip and you know sometimes get into little little mini turf wars and it's all very silly, but I've actually made some very, very good friends through that um, and some colleagues and, and, and met some really excellent young critics. It's been my primary conduit for finding the next generation of, of critics, including a lot of young women and people of color and typically people who did not get into the game when I was coming up. Um, so in that, in that sense, it's been an extremely valuable social media um, tool. Uh, yeah. I am extremely distressed at what's happening with it. Um, I think personally, I think Elon Musk is um, tearing it to pieces. I don't think he's, I think he is treating it the way a, an adolescent boy would uh, with a new widget. Um, and I think that he right. is, um, the way he's treating the people who uh, work there, um, mm -hmm. firing many of them, firing many of mm -hmm. them with uh, in ways that will probably come back to haunt him legally. Um, the ways he is responding to his critics um, is immature at best and and um, uh, you know ruinous to what is what can be a very valuable information platform um, at worst. Uh, it is a place where a lot of journalists, 
first uh, trade information. And it is, uh, to me, I actually use it as a, the canary in the coal mine in terms of news. Um, I often right. will hear news on Twitter first, and then I will go start triangulating, triangulating um, with more official news services, um, the Times, the Washington Post, um, MSNBC, CNN, what have you, uh, for the details. But often it's the sort of first line of information. Uh, and I think journalists use it that way, professional journalists, mm -hmm. in a way mm -hmm. that if it goes away, will not be a good thing. Well, maybe one of those other uh, companies that are similar to to uh, to Twitter. I uh, can't think of the name of it. Uh, well, I've started an it. account on Mastodon, which is um, a much more polite version of Twitter, which is all to the good. Um, so we'll see where that goes. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the worst part of Twitter is that it enables a lot of misinformation and a lot of um, right. uh, abuse, online abuse. Um, and it right. would be nice to find a a platform that monitored that and um, and really took pains to uh, sort of erase that aspect of it from the experience. Well, we get to we get to watch it and see how it pans out. Mm -hmm. um, and then I assume somebody will make a movie movie of it. Like, what do you think? <laughs> I'm sure they're already working on it. <laughs> um, speaking of. Uh, uh, of of people and and making a comeback, uh, you know this guy named named Trump uh, uh, recently decided that he was going to throw his hat into the 2024. Um, and how do you think the public takes to Trump with all that's well, gone on? With that well, John, you're asking a movie critic. So when you're talking about comebacks, I'm, I'm more easy talking about something like Brendan Fraser coming back in the whale. Um, <laughs> but I do have opinions and uh, my stuff uh -huh. occasionally wax political. I am not a fan of Mr. Trump. I will just say that um, as a understatement. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I think he has been extremely injurious to this country. Um, he's had help. Uh, I do personally, and again, this is my personal opinion, Mm -hmm. think that he is coming back diminished. Um, I think the bloom is off the rose. The stink is off the, um, what you scrape off your shoe. Um, and I think that he will be less, I think his moment has passed. I would be very happy to have be proved right in that. But I feel like, especially after the most recent midterms, which really was not just a referendum. It wasn't a referendum on him. It was a referendum on his vision of America and the people who believe, who want to believe what he pushes, which is, mm -hmm. in my mind, a extremely anti-democratic, even fascistic worldview in which autocracy matters and your vote doesn't matter at all. Um, I think that the recent midterms basically uh, said that Americans uh, don't want to see that. Um, it was a rejection of uh, his worldview. I think he's coming back, throwing his hat in the ring. He thinks I think he thinks it might help him avoid getting indicted. Um, I don't believe that's the case. And um, honestly, I'm sick and tired of him. I am more than ready to see him, to never hear about him for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, we will be hearing about him for quite some time. Of course. Of course. Um, I thought that, and you'll know this, of course you will, the, the new movies that came out during this past year. Hmm. Um, what do you think about the new Top Gun sequel? I think that it is, have you, you've seen the original Top Gun, right? Of course, yeah. Have you, have you seen it recently? Uh, no, I've not seen the new the sequel. I've not seen the sequel. Oh, no, have you seen the old, the original one anytime recently? Uh, yeah, probably a, a couple of years. Yeah. It all. doesn't hold up that well. It's not that great a movie. It's very much of its of its era. The new one, by contrast, I think is a much better made film. I think it's actually one of those blockbusters that pushes every button. Um, and I am not particularly a fan of uh of 
sort of jingoistic military movies that just sort of like pit us against a faceless enemy just so we can feel good about ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. But this movie does it <laughs> damn well. Um, and, you know, it gets you, rooting in, gets you rooting in the theater. Um, I think it's, 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 almost like the Aristotelian ideal of the modern Hollywood blockbuster. Um, it's extremely well-made and it's exactly what the kind of thing that Tom Cruise is perfect for. I actually think he, he's better in this than he was in the original. That's good to hear. Um, I'm not sure if it's still in theaters. Um, I think it might, it, they might bring it back before the end of the year in theaters, but yes, that's correct. It should, it will probably be coming out on demand soon. It is a movie right. that plays, plays better in theaters than, and than on the home screen, I would argue. Right. Another question for you. Uh, and I just ran across this by, by flipping on the, on the, uh, internet, uh, just, you know, searching, searching. And I ran across, um, singing in the rain. Oh dear, yes. And, I, and I'm asking you a question here. Is it really a timeless movie? What do you think? Uh, I'd like to see it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, well, John, I have to tell you, um, about 15 years ago, I wrote, I wrote a book. Um, one of my books is called The Best Old Movies for Families. And it is about turning your kids onto classic films. And by classic films, I mean right. from the 80s, I mean from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and 60s. And right. the first movie in that book, the first movie I talk about in that book, and I talk about watching it with my daughters, my older daughter who is, um, who is now 27, um, is Singing in the Rain. And right. I showed it to her when she was Three, which sounds ridiculously young, and it was ridiculously young, <laughs> but she loved it and went around singing the songs with her version of the lyrics, her little toddler version of the lyrics um, right. for, for weeks. More to the point, it's a movie you can show anybody of any age, and they it's time, it, it is timeless, even though it is about a very specific time in Hollywood history, the changeover from the silent era to a talky era. Um, and it incorporates a lot of actual events that happened in that time period but it is so joyful the songs are so good the dancing is so marvelous gene right. kelly is so right. terrific um yeah. it, it is it is ageless you can show anybody that movie except maybe a disaffected 13 year old who doesn't want anything to do with you um even they would end up liking this movie um but yes absolutely i to me the litmus test is can you show it to you know, a six-year-old and they will roll with it. Absolutely. It's, it's, it is a movie that, that, um, I, is it? My, my recent grandsons are, are age five and age three. And, um, uh, they're, they're really into the, in that kind of stuff. Um, so I'll, I'll have to put that in front of them and they'll be singing those, those songs all time long. John, can I, can I give you a recommendation? Sure. Uh, and again, um, this is this is in the book I wrote 15 years ago. Um, young boys, maybe the three year olds a little too young, but, uh, uh, you know, wait till they're like five and six and seven. Show them the, the adventures of Robin Hood with Errol Flynn. Right. Um, and you're not going to believe this, but show them um, a silent comedy. Show them Chaplin in in um, the Gold uh -huh. Rush. Show them Harold Lloyd in um, right. in the one where he climbs, he climbs the clock tower. Little kids do not know that old movies are good for you. They don't know right. that, you know, black and white <laughs> is an old thing. They just know it's really funny. It's really enjoyable. And I have seen little kids just go nuts for a silent comedy, for like a Buster Keaton right. comedy, a Charlie Chaplin comedy. Those, those things, you know, some old movies do not translate, but the ones that do really do. Right. Did uh, Sergeant York make the cut? You know, no, it's not in my book. I think it's a good movie. Um, Gary Cooper. And, and, and yeah, okay, I, lo I love Gary Cooper. And there's some other Gary Cooper movies that I talked about in that book. I did not show it to, I have, a, I have daughters, but I had a son that might've been different. Um, I did not show that one to them, but I, it's a, ha a, it's a Howard Hawks film and anything he does is okay in my book. Mm -hmm. Now, the, um, in, in, in looking at that, and looking at some of the pages from your website, and I'm going to say that the book has the number 50 on it. Is that right? A book of movies? 
that's a different book. That's an ebook that I wrote called the 50 movie starter kit. Uh, so what, to, what to know if you want to know what you're talking about. Basically, it's a way to introduce people who are, you know, like movies, but really don't know what the what the sort of classics are, the ones that they should see if they want to sort of get a little more serious about watching movies. So it really is here are the 50 to start with. Here are the 50 sort of great movies that right. pretty much a lot of people agree on. Some of them are Hollywood. Some of them are from other countries. Um, Start here, in other words. It's my idea mm -hmm. of start here. Mm -hmm. And you can find that online. Find on where? You can find it online. It's available through, through Amazon as an ebook. Okay. With your name on it. With my name on it. Very good. <laughs> uh, I used to watch the Academy Awards. Mm -hmm. That was always a big deal. And then I'm, I, over the last, I'm going to say, Three to five years, five to ten years, it's gotten re really political. And um, is that going to continue uh, based upon the people you know and see and so forth? I would say it was getting political back in the in the seventies. You know when uh, when Coming Home was winning Oscars and people were you know Jane Fonda was getting up there giving political speeches, um, and when Marlon Brando you know refused his Godfather Oscar and sent. Uh, Sachin Littlefeather out to get it. There, there's always been a tension uh -huh. between Hollywood as entertainment and Hollywood as message. And in the classic studio era, um, the studios didn't want that message to get overtly political because they, they were afraid it would turn people off, which it, uh -huh. to some extent it does. Um, and I think that changed with the st studio decline in the 70s and the sort of the rise of independent production. Um, but the Oscars have always been, always, not about necessarily what the best movie or best performances of the year are, mm -hmm. but right. what the, the film industry, and remember the people who choose the Oscars, the Academy, they are made up of the people who make the movies, not the critics, not regular moviegoers. I'm not right. in the Academy. Um, right. What gets chosen is what makes that body of people feel best about what they do at the moment they're filling out their ballots. And if that movie is, is pushing a social message or a message of social advancement, often that will make people say, well, this is what makes me proud of what I do. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, I, you know, honestly, awards, the awards shows are the, the award ceremonies themselves should be fun. I agree. They should be glitzy. They should be entertaining. Um, and But I also feel that if you win an Oscar, you should say whatever you feel like. You know, right. it's your moment in the spotlight. You want to be political? Fine, go for it. You want to not be political? You want to thank your mom? Thank your mom. Um, <laughs> you know, why not? So I'm sort of uh, mixed meetings. I will say that the change that uh, in recent years, the, uh, the Motion Picture Academy has made a concerted effort to bring in younger voters and uh -huh. voters, a more diverse group of voters. And to my mind, that is resulting in a greater body of films of different kinds of films, big entertainments, small right. challenging dramas, all sort of being in the mix. And to me, that's good. The more different kinds of films getting in there is, uh, exposing them to people watching the show. I uh, was again looking and discovered that you were a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in criticism. And that's true, I was. In How was that? Um, that's very nice. I mean, it, 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 when you're a finalist, you get a, it, it's very nice. You're, in, you're one of three um, as chosen by the committee. Um, and then the uh, the over overarching committee chooses the winner out of those three, but being a finalist is ex extremely on a, a big honor and very gratifying. Um, doesn't <laughs> being a winner comes with a cash prize? That's nice. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but being, being a finalist is really being. I mean, it, it's the Oscars of journalism. It is really being recognized by your peers, um, and that uh, you know, there, there's no greater honor. Uh, sort of being recognized. I, I love what I do. I, I I really enjoy what I do. I love movies. Any movie critic I know got into this, not because we want to sit there and be judgmental, but because we love movies. We fell in love with movies when we were kids or teenagers or what have you. 
I and mean, we love writing about them. We love turning people on to new ones, to fresh ideas, fresh visions, entertaining visions. Um, so I have the I have the job. I, I'm the luckiest person in the world. I have the job I always I always wanted to do when I was young, um, and I have fun doing it. And hopefully, readers get information and entertainment and are led to good experiences. So it was really really nice to be recognized for that. Um, you know, a cherry on the top of, of my career. Congratulations again. Thank you. <laughs> it's important. It is. I uh, uh, was thinking about my audience. and You would share with them where you can find you, where you can find your, your newsletter, any books, things like that. Sure. Uh, um, if you'll do if that, I, please. Sure. If I can, I just want to give a little bit of the background on why I started this newsletter. Um, and left really left the newspaper to do it. Um, I felt we weren't covering movies the way people watch them anymore. They come out on theaters, but in theaters, but increasingly on demand. Um, and we all have these subscription services. We, everybody's got Netflix. Most people have Amazon Prime. There's Hulu, HBO Max, all these different services. We have no idea what's on them. Um, and uh, to me, there's a real need for a guide to cut through all that tsunami of content and say, here's a good movie, here's a good TV show. Um, and that's what my newsletter, Tiber's Watchlist, does. So two, three times a week, you get an email from me in my your inbox. It's free. If you decide to be a paid subscriber, you get some extra posts and the ability to join in the conversation online. And I've got a great, great bunch of um, subscribers who have wonderful conversations. Um, but in that email, you I'll be talking about I'll just say, here's a new movie in theaters, or here's a new movie that's on Netflix. It might be, it might be not a new movie. It might be a classic that's on Turner Classics that I really won't think you should pay attention to. It might be a I TV do. show that my wife and I are watching that everybody's talking about. So it's a way to help people through this, this thicket, thicket of, of content that's out there. So the way to find it is to go on your browser to tiberswatchlist.substack. Dot com. That's one word, tiberswatchlist.substack.com. And you can sign up for the newsletter there. And I hope you do. It's, I'm really enjoying writing it. Well, that's great. That's great. I know my, uh, my listeners are glad that they tuned in today. I'm glad that you had the time to visit with us and see what, uh, what your world consists of. And it's been interesting, very interesting. Um, I want to. Um, thank you again, and also searching my integrity listeners as well. Uh, and I always say, so long and happy trails to all. Thank you very much, John. It's been a delight to be on your show. Thank you, Ty.